everyone tonight. God bless you. Thank you for coming to Sons of God Ministries, where tonight we are starting this new series on the geoengineered revelation prophecy and the controversy of Zion. Tonight we are going to be starting this series with a big bang. We're going to be starting right out of the front gate with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he returned in 70 AD and scripture proves it. And then we're going to show you how they are going to actually try to create a deception to bring a false Jesus onto the scene. Now tonight what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and lay a little bit of groundwork on the scriptures. Then we're going to go ahead and show you the steps to Project Blue Beam. We're not going to jump into depth in all these steps. Actually throughout the next couple of weeks we will be jumping into the depth within all these steps so that you get a clearer understanding of what is really going on and what is happening within our world today. But without further ado, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to jump straight into the scriptures. So, let's go ahead and get into it. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Everyone always talks about how every eye will see the Lord Jesus. It says, Behold, he comes on the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. Dispensationalists and futurists and people that don't understand the Bible like they should always jump to this verse because they're like, oh yeah, every eye means that the whole entire world has to see them, see Jesus. And they try to put it 2,000 years on in the future because there was never a world event that all eyes would see him. But what does the scripture have to say? Well, if we jump back four verses into Revelation 1-3, let us read what the word of God has to say. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So how do you make it to the point where the time is at hand 2,000 years later? You can't do that possibly with scripture. We're going to jump into a couple of verses, but before we do, let us go ahead and talk about Acts chapter 1. A chapter that is used by futurists to say that Jesus Christ is going to come back into a bodily resurrection or bodily uh, transfiguration or power. You see, the problem with their understanding is this, though. Let us go from verse 8. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. I want you guys to notice something. Do you ever see... Something about Jesus Christ going up into heaven in his physical manifestation. The focus is not on the physical manifestation of the Lord Jesus. Because his kingdom is a spiritual one. The focus is on the clouds of heaven. Why is this important? Because this is metaphorical and symbolic language that was used within the Old Testament scriptures to show that judgment was coming. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 19 to see this very language. Isaiah 19, verse 1. What does the Bible say? The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Okay. Let's go ahead and lay a foundation here, you guys. I want to show you something. Right here in Acts chapter 1. Why is it that these two men that were with the Lord Jesus in white apparel said to the disciples that you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from ye into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Why is it that... The Lord Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 16, 27, 28, that there are some of you that are standing here that shall not taste the death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That was clearly a reference to the Son of Man coming in the glory of the clouds of heaven with the holy angels. 
sitting on his throne. Now, why don't people accept this? Because 95% of mainstream Christianity, dispensational Zionism, John Hagee, Thomas Sice, uh, Hale Lindsey, uh, Tim LaHaye, all of these dispensationalists, they teach a doctrine that is opposite to Scripture and what the Bible tells us. If you notice in Acts 1, verse 8 to 11, there's no mention of the physical manifestation of Christ. It's about the clouds of heaven. If you notice in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, the judgment language is about the Lord coming on the clouds. That's exactly what happened in the Jewish war of three and a half years from 66 to 70 AD. Now, with that understanding, let us look at some scriptures on this. Revelation 1, verse 3, the time is at hand. Didn't Jesus say in Mark 1, 14 to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Why do people try to say that's 2,000 years on in the future? The kingdom of God was at hand in the days of the disciples. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. We live in that kingdom of God right now. So, let us keep on going. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. A text that the apostle Paul was writing to the Thessalonians in his own day. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Okay. He was clearly referencing that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be something of beauty even to the Thessalonians within their own day. Why would Paul have this language with a first century audience and say that you guys are going to see the coming of the Lord, but wait, 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 you guys aren't going to see it till 2,000 years later. That makes no sense at all. Let us keep on going. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Their body, you guys. Basically, what he was saying is don't fall into the lust of the flesh. Don't fall into uh, uh, basically evil and wickedness. Be blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus, not 2,000 years on in the future, within their own generation. Because the persecution was coming on their own generation with Nero and Titus Vespasian. Let's keep on going. 1 Corinthians 1 7. What does Paul say? So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do people throw it out into a 2,000 year future when the Language is specifically to the Corinthians and Thessalonians of first century Israel. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. This is important. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Didn't the Lord Jesus say to Nicodemus that if I can't even tell you about how to become born again, if you're thinking that you have to go back into your mother's womb a second time in order to be born again, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, if I can't even teach you of earthly things, how can I teach you of heavenly things? You see, the earthly things are of the natural man. The heavenly things are of the spiritual man. That's why the Lord Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. Because only the spiritual man can discern the things of the Spirit through the Spirit of God. Do you guys understand what we're getting at right now? I pray that this is making sense. Let's go to James 5.8. What does James say? Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Not 2,000 years out in the future. It was coming nigh in their own generation. Jesus was coming on the clouds of judgment, just like Acts 1.8 speaks of, because this is metaphorical and symbolic language that points us to Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1. The metaphorical and symbolic language of the prophets of the Old Testament is so important to understand Jesus in his Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, which are exactly the same paradigm and the same exact things that they are talking about they are all talking about 70 AD in the Jewish war but most people won't have eyes to see or ears to hear 
Now, now that we have this understanding on these things, what we're going to go ahead and do is, I laid a groundwork to show you that Jesus Christ had to come within his own generation. It literally said the coming of the Lord is nigh. It literally said that the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. You will not be able to say, here it is or there it is. You see, people that think that Jesus is going to bring an earthly kingdom, like 95% of dispensationalists, all they are is falling into Phariseeism. I want you guys to really think about that. Jesus never promised an earthly kingdom. Even in John chapter 6. Let, let's go to John chapter 6. John 6. Let's go to verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. They were going to try to raise him up as an earthly king. He didn't want that. He knew that wasn't the prophecy that was foretold in the Old Testament. He knew that he would reign on the throne of David, which would be a heavenly kingdom after the seed of Abraham. You see, there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. Jesus never wanted an earthly kingdom. It was always about a spiritual kingdom. You can't contradict the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. Now, that we, now that we have laid that groundwork, let us look a little bit into Project Bluebeam. I'm going to show you guys a, something, a little bit of something and how they're going to deceive people to make them get on the agenda of the New World Order and get on the agenda of this beast system that's coming. Let's check this out. So there's certain steps within Project Bluebeam. We're not going to break all these down tonight, but we will go through them. Step one, breakdown of archaeological knowledge. They're going to use artificial earthquakes, tsunamis, and natural disasters. This is through something called Project Harp. They have the ability to manipulate weather patterns. If you guys remember, over in the Canary Islands, there was multiple uh, earthquakes that were taking place and volcanoes that were going off. A couple of months before... Uh, we actually figured some things out about these volcanoes going off in the Canary Islands. There were people that were trying to say that this was the second or third trumpet of Revelation. And I explained on a TikTok video about how this is not what was spoken of in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, this is being geoengineered. Come to find out, two months later, we learned that... There was a grid pattern that was being used with the earthquakes that were going off to cause these volcanoes. And they were in a perfect row. You see, because the elite, the, the uh, controllers of the world, Satan himself, who controls this world and is the god of this world, they have the ability to use something called a thumper weapon. A thumper shocker weapon can actually create an earthquake. These... These things are not conspiracy. Matter of fact, if you guys look, the European Union called the project a global concern and passed a resolution calling for more information on its health and environmental risks. They will use these weapons, and they already are starting to, to dig up archaeological finds to try to prove things that are coming to pass. Why do I say this, though? Because they are going to use these archaeological finds to actually bring evidence forth to say it's real evidence, but it's not, that the Bible is not true and everything points to a one world religion. Why do I say this? I am not bashing this man that I am about to bring up, but I am going to tell you this much. According to the word of God, we cannot have contradictions with scripture. You see, there is a man known as, let's see, Ron Wyatt. This man discovered Noah's Ark. He discovered the Ark of the Covenant. He discovered even Egyptian chariot wheels underneath the ground. Now, I have no problem with archaeological finds. When I have a problem with things is when this man says that when he discovered the Ark of the Covenant, he had two angels that actually told him that this will not be revealed until the mark of the beast is given. Here's the problem with this. 
How can the mark of the beast be given when the revelation had to be fulfilled within 70 AD because the time of the judgment was nigh unto coming? You see, what you have to understand is this. Let us go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is very, very specific on the way things will play out. And the Jews knew this of first century Israel. Let us read from verse 24 though. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, let's look at this first off, you guys. First things first, the 70 weeks are a representation of 77s, 490 years. Once the 490 years are done, that means that there's going to be a end or a finish to the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, why do dispensationalists push this all the way out into the future. They try to say that there are seven dispensations. First off, you have innocence, conscience, human government. This all comes from Darby, by the way, which we will be getting more into as we go through this series. But they have these dispensations. They have innocence, conscience, human government, promise law, which was under Moses. Then they have grace, which they say is a 2,000-year period. Then there's a seven-year tribulation. The rapture has to take place at the beginning. Then they go back under the tribulation, which is the law, which makes no sense whatsoever. Jesus Christ returns, and there's a literal 1,000 years on earth. I've already told you guys that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It is a spiritual kingdom. So by them trying to say this, they are contradicting the words of God. It's almost like they're under a spell or something. I don't understand how they can sit here and contradict the word of God. But anyways, there's this tribulation period. Ron Wyatt is trying to say that this Ark of the Covenant will be discovered within the seven-year tribulation period with the Mark of the Beast. However, Daniel 9 tells us that there would have to be an end of sins, a finish of the transgressions, a reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. If the 70 weeks of Daniel are not done, that means that they have to be thrown into this little segment right here of the seven-year tribulation. And that means, if we go back into the Age of Grace... There's no forgiveness of sins. Do you guys understand what we're getting at right now? If the 70 weeks of Daniel are not done, there's no end of sins. There's no finish to the transgression. There's no reconciliation for iniquity. You're still in your sin. You're not saved by the cross and the blood of Jesus. You're not saved by those things. If the 70 weeks are not done, the blood of Jesus is of no effect. Because it says that the end of sins will be made in everlasting righteousness. And there will be a seal up in the vision of prophecy. So if we are not done with the 70 weeks of Daniel, that means that it has to be done within this little period of time. And anything be before this, there was no end of sins. That means that there could be no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, that means the resurrection has to occur within this little time period. That means anyone that dies, they're not forgiven. Do you guys see the problems that this creates? It creates a major problem. But if it is done, and it was done within this temple being destroyed, 70 AD, which is not a shadow of things, which was the truth because Jesus' coming was nigh and the clouds of judgment is a representation of the destruction of that temple based on Matthew 23 and 24, that this generation will not pass away. All of the blood shed from Abel, the righteous Zechariah, will be upon this generation of the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. What does that mean? That means that the 70 weeks are done. That means that the finish of the transgression is done. That means the end of sin is done. Reconciliation for sin. Everything is done. Everlasting righteousness. The vision has been sealed up. And the prophecy is sealed up. That means that there's no more prophecy. 
Why is this important? Let us jump to 1 Corinthians. Okay? We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is speaking about love. But let us go down. What does Paul say? Paul says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay. What is Paul talking about right here? Let's actually jump down to verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide of faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. Okay. Basically what he's saying is that love is more important than any gifts of the Spirit at the end of the day. But what is Paul talking about in verse 12? He's talking about the veil that was placed over Moses. He's talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. When it's talking about the veil being removed in us seeing in part, but when perfection has come in, we will see God face to face. That's exactly what happened with the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's why if this hasn't been done, then we're doomed. There's no end of sins. But if it is done, then... Thank you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, because he fulfilled everything within the book. And if that is the case, then all of this, up to this point here and here, is all a bunch of BS. But guess what? If that is the case, that we are done, then the prophecy has been sealed up. Revelation is known as the spirit of prophecy, and the spirit of prophecy is Jesus. So if the vision is sealed... And the prophecy is sealed. That means revelation has been sealed and it's done according to the ending of the 70 weeks of Daniel. You guys understand what we're talking about right here. And if that's the case, there is no more vision or prophecy or whatever. God can give you dreams or visions. He can do whatever he wants to do. But at the end of the day, when a couple of angels came to this man and told him that when the Ark of the Covenant is discovered, that's when the Mark of the Beast will be given. That contradicts the scriptures. That's not possible. That's what we're trying to get at here. Which is why these archaeological finds are going to lead to other things where people are going to start to think that, oh, we must be in the tribulation period. We must be in this little seven-year period of Jacob's trouble. When they don't realize that way back here, this was a seven-year period. For the destruction of the temple. Seven years, three and a half years of tribulation and three and a half years of great tribulation. Okay? Very important. Now, that's step one, the archaeological find. Step two is that there's going to be a gigantic light show. This is going to be through Bluebeam. You see, what they're going to do through this, you guys, they're going to say that people over in China are going to see Buddha as apparition in the sky, Gautama Buddha. People over in India are going to see Hare Krishna in the sky. People over in America, here in America, they're going to go ahead and see Jesus in the sky. The Indians are going to see Quetzalcoatl or whatever his name is. They're going to see all these apparitions of people that they see. But then what's going to end up occurring is is that they're going to all manifest and become one, and it's going to become this false antichrist that people are going to say that's coming. This is all geoengineered. The antichrist of uh, the Jewish war, of when a revelation played out, was either Emperor Nero or Titus Vespasian. The reason why I say that, Nero had the greatest persecution of them all, but Titus Vespasian also was able to heal people, and he was worshipped in the holy place. So there's, there's a lot of things that people don't realize, but uh, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, Titus Vespasian did that would coincide with him being the Antichrist. Now, if that's the case that they're going to see these apparitions come, and they're going to become one, and it's going to be like a, uh, an Antichrist figure, let us see what John had to say first off, okay? This is how we can nip this in the bud right here. Little children, it is the last time. All right, it's the last time. It's the last days. 
John was talking about the last days, the last days of Old Covenant Israel, which is what Jesus was talking about. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. The Antichrist would come in the last time, and John said he was living in the last time. How do you say 2,000 years later, you are in the last time? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The last time was in the days of the disciples, just like Jesus said. So the Antichrist had to be within those days. You see, what's happening now is they're geoengineering the Revelation prophecy to make it look like an Antichrist figure is coming forward to form a new world order and government through the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, through all of these things that brought Israel back into the land in 1948. But based off of Scripture in Deuteronomy 28-30, to a nation cannot come back into the homeland based on unbelief. And all the nation of Israel is is an Antichrist nation that has not accepted their Messiah. That's why it's not about national salvation anymore. It's about individual salvation. And I'm not speaking an anti-Semitic gospel right now. I'm telling you guys the God honest truth. Now, through the archaeological finds, they're going to cause people to start doubting their faiths. They're going to cause apparitions to show up in the air through Project Blue Beam which actually coincides with some other things about how there has been governmental figures that have come forward and said that these things are going to come forward by 2024, which I find that to be interesting, which I believe the Lord is really preparing us for these things. Step three, they are going to use a thought conversion technology. What's interesting about that? Well, doesn't... Elon Musk wants to implant brain chips into humans' minds. That's why we see this this, uh, technocracy coming forward. That could definitely be a step in the direction that they want to go with Project Blue Beam. But not only that, they're going to use low-frequency waves to actually cause these things to occur as well. And fourthly, they're going to use manifestations of supernatural entities to come forward to make it look like The end of the world is coming. But also the rapture. They're going to bring a false rapture narrative forward because once they do, based on a dispensational time chart, it starts the final seven years. And guys, do you know what that means if this final seven years right here starts based on their little conception? If the rapture takes place right here, and let's say people go up through Project Blue Beam, Because that's their ultimate plan, to make it look like this. When Jesus clearly tells us in Matthew 13 that it's the tares that are taken, not the wheat, then that means that the tribulation starts and there's going to be three and a half years of rule under the harlot Catholic Church, which they're going to pretty much say some things about probably the mark of the beast being Sunday law. And then three and a half years into that, the Antichrist, this man of sin that takes an apparition in the sky, he's going to come forward and he's going to rule everything and he's going to bring a false tribulation period. Now, one thing I find interesting about this though is, and this is just a theory, just by speculation, I believe that even this rapture narrative may not even be on the table. I believe that it's not going to be a pre-trib rapture in a sense, but a post-trib rapture. So when they bring this Antichrist figure forward, they're going to say he's Jesus or Yeshua. He's going to put people back underneath the law according to Isaiah chapter 2, which was fulfilled in the last days that even Peter said he was living in. And they're going to bring a false narrative forward for a thousand year millennial reign. Okay? What you guys need to understand and stick with is this, is that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's the main thing when it comes down to it. Jesus does not want an earthly kingdom. He has a spiritual kingdom. I pray that if this is making sense, that you will go pray about this and ask the Lord if I am telling you the truth. Because we got some very, very serious stuff coming forward, but we are going to be getting into a lot of deep stuff as it is. Now, Anyways, you guys, basically, we're just laying a foundation right here. I'm trying to show you guys how how things are going to play out. But, needless to say, if you guys would like to support this ministry, because we can always use your support at the end of the day. We are not under tithing. We are under 
the law of life and spirit in Christ Jesus, that God loves a cherishable giver. What you can do if you want to support this ministry, you go to our channel, sonsofgodministries.org, and you go to the donations tab. You go ahead and click it, and once you do, it's going to bring up the donation page. You can go ahead and give whatever amount you want. doesn't matter. All you have to do to get back is click the shield, and you are good to go. Now, if you guys want to, you guys can look at the website. I am actually looking at creating an app right now that talks about preterism, and it's going to bring everything to the forefront, and it's going to bring all of the scripture together. Anyways, you guys, this is the first episode out of this series that we are creating on the geoengineered revelation prophecy and the controversy of Zion. I pray that this was a blessing, and I pray that you are seeing these truths coming forward. God bless you guys. I love you, and you have a great night.